So um, I'm one of those people who uh, probably his connection to the ocean might be a little too too strong. I've noticed that my, my moods are highly correlated with how much time I spend near the ocean, how much I'm surfing, and therefore um, I'm not really that fun to be around when it's been a few weeks um, in the water or uh, I've been landlocked for a while. And I, I'm sure there's some people in the audience who can relate to that. Um, so this is one of my favorite places. This is uh, Point Lobos, just a few miles down the coast here. And I think those of us who really love the ocean have an instinct when we see beautiful places like this to think that they're priceless and to think that the commodification of nature, the kind of putting price tags on everything, is actually the root cause of, of um, nature's destruction, particularly the oceans and coasts. And I think that, the, the, you know, that instinct makes sense in a lot of ways, but I want to spend the rest of um, the, the time I have with you to say that I think it's actually counterproductive. Um, I think there's a, a really interesting paradox, which is the things that we think of as most priceless and sacred are actually the things that need price tags the most. And so um, I'm an economist, and I, when I look out at areas like this, I see things in dollar values. So, and I particularly see things that the market doesn't pick up, um, what are called non-market values. So for example, the fish here in Point Lobos, it's not just the commercial value, uh, it's not just what people get selling it, it's also the scuba divers who really like to see it. Um, the otters, um, the otters aren't just, you know, a, a nice furry thing that, you know, every, that everybody loves, they're also something that generates tremendous amount of tourism dollars, millions of dollars um, a year for the local economy and probably hundreds of millions uh, more broadly. In addition, with, there's more research has um, uh, been shown now that otters play a very key role in maintaining kelp forests. And what we're now realizing about kelp forests is that they're incredible carbon sequestration um, sites. And so if we start putting a value on the carbon sequestration of kelp forests, it's actually, again, maybe even hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, we look out at the waves, and uh, there's huge, um, both for surfing, we'll, we'll get into the surf economics in a moment, um, but also the, um, the wave potential, the renewable energy potential from waves. Birds, you look at the seabirds here, this is one of the highest biodiversity areas for birding in the world, and people come from all over um, to, to, to view the birds. And so when I look out at a landscape like this, I see tremendous economic value. Um, and the, the key point I want to drive home here is that if we don't, um, aren't explicit about these values, they often get ignored, because the default value for policy decisions and for business decisions is zero for a lot of these things. So I'm going to walk you um, through a few stories to kind of illustrate how important uh, identifying these non-market values is for those of us who want to uh, protect um, nature and also to promote sustainability in the oceans and coasts. So our first story is going to be more than just about economics. It's actually going to be about life and death. And this is because not properly valuing the environment is actually can be very dangerous business. So our, our slides here, our pictures, on the left is an area around New Orleans, um, some original wetlands, and the picture was taken in 1959. And the picture on the right, it's a little hard to see, but you can see on the right there, there's this kind of channel's been dug out, and there's not the wetlands. And a lot of this was done for shipping lanes. And so a lot of the wetlands were looked on as nuisance. It was kind of breeding ground for bugs. It was an impediment to economic development. And these were dredged for shipping lanes and for industrial parks. And it turns out that thinking what that went behind this was really faulty, that people didn't understand the incredible value that these wetlands provide for something really, really important. And what that really, really important thing was, was storm protection. And so when these wetlands were removed, we had, um, by all accounts, all scientific estimates, the uh, impact of Hurricane Katrina on New Orleans, which destroyed one of America's great cities, um, was way, probably orders of magnitude potentially worse than it would have been, and a lot of the worst damage would have been prevented. And let's, you know, pause here to consider that, you know, almost 2,000 people also died in this. Um, this wasn't just economic damage, this is um, the human life that was at stake. And, and so we now know that these wetlands are actually worth, if we look at the storm damage um, mitigation that they provide, hundreds or even thousands of dollars an acre, and uh, unfortunately, sadly, a lot of this information and studies has been coming out from the uh, impacts of the Asian tsunami. And a lot of places that were um, hit in Indonesia and Thailand and South India, um, where they had cleared the wetlands, a lot more people died and a lot more damage. Um, and so we're really, once we include the, the true value of the wetlands here, um, the case for preservation makes 
makes economic sense. So our next story is coming, going out to the oceans, and this is about um, seafood sustainability, which you've heard about already a little, but I want to add a little twist to it. And so in a lot of ways, what the seafood sustainability movement is about is incorporating non-market values into these commodity chains. So we have all these notions of bycatch and ecological sustainability and biodiversity and certain methods that are really bad that we want to ban, maybe the long line or the trawling. And, and we, by doing so, we create a price premium. And so as we, we saw, wild salmon's a lot better um, than farm salmon. There's no question about that. It's also a lot more expensive. It's two to three times more expensive. And so that's the incorporation of these non-market values into this commodity. Um, and a couple key things to remember is that seafood is a very unique commodity in many ways. First of all, obviously, the, the methods being very far off land. Very few people even know what's going on. There's very few monitoring. There's just a lot of kind of mystery about um, how seafood is, is, um, is, is produced. But even more fundamental is it was very hard to identify seafood. So I have a picture of fillets here. How many of you probably know what this is? Um, I would guess very, very few of you could identify. This is actually sablefish. Um, I had no idea. So most of you, or all of you hopefully, would be able to know what a carrot or an avocado is um, in a store. But how many of you, when you go to buy something, do you really know um, what you're buying? In a restaurant, a, a frozen fish stick? You know, you, it says what it is, but how do you know? And so this has created a problem. And it's called imposter fish is the term for it. And it turns out that some random DNA testing 50% um, or more of all fish bought in restaurants and stores is mislabeled. And I want to be clear about the mislabeling. This isn't errors. This isn't, well, the system's so complex that, you know, mistakes get made. It's categorically low-value species being labeled as high-value species, endangered species being labeled as unendangered species. And so this is only in one direction, which if you know anything about statistics on this scale, this is purposeful. And so this is fraud. And, um, and why this is really important is because the, all the work that the sustainable seafood movement has done, which has been tremendous about changing people's behavior and getting people to look at their seafood watch cards and, and look for certification, um, it really is undermined if we don't know what we're buying. And so the, this second story is kind of a cautionary tale that we, if we identify non-market values and build them into chains, which is exactly what we need to do, if we don't have a verifiable system that's really accurate, we create incentives for fraud, and, and we actually have extremely strong evidence that that's happening right now. Our third example, our third story, comes back to the coasts. And so I'm going to show you a couple very classic surf break pictures. So this is um, down in LA. Our next wave here is in Portugal, a beautiful A-frame wave in Portugal. And our final wave here is off of Baja, California. And this, these waves and a number of others on this um, list I'm about to uh, show you here um, are extinct. These waves are done through dredging, jetties, pollution, sand mining. Um, and as a surfer, it really, really pains me to think that these are now no longer rideable and they are in the history books and all we have is a few um, old photos of them. But we will um, end on a good note, which is that there is a new um, movement of what's called surf economics or surf economics and there's, it's led by a lot of NGOs, committed surfers and, and economists. And what they're doing is starting to kind of document the economic contribution of surfing to local economies to regional economies, and they are, they've created lists of endangered waves, and they're protecting them. And so this wave here is a chinchilla. It's an um, endangered wave that the Save the Waves Foundation has identified as a top priority, and they're working tirelessly right now to get this saved from, from some um, industrial development. And more close to home here, just about 40 miles up the coast in Santa Cruz, the world-class surf breaks, this is Pleasure Point, all the way up to the north of Santa Cruz have now been designated part of a World Surfing Reserve Program. And it's similar to the uh, UNESCO World Heritage Site. And now there's a, uh, a management plan in place to save these waves. And a lot of the, um, the impetus behind this was the economics, was showing that surfing isn't just for hippies and kind of people who live out of their van, that it actually is good for business. Um, and so how do we calculate the value of waves? Well, really quickly, we can do all kinds of things to look at 
the, uh, the, the impact on local economies, and we can look at how, many pe how long people travel um, to get to these spots as kind of a, a, a proxy for their economic kind of demand curve for these waves and trace out some valuation there. And then it also turns out, and I have some students working on this right now, that the housing values near good surf breaks are much higher. And this then leads to increased tax revenue because tax revenue for local governments is directly through property taxes. So with some good economic analysis, we can actually see how much directly to the tax base surf breaks are contributing to the local economy. And so it's uh, quite, quite promising. So uh, I just want to end on um, the note that um, that again, our instincts of wanting to save things in, in nature, especially in the oceans and coasts, that it's somehow priceless, that that instinct, as, as, as good as it is, is actually counterproductive. And that you know, the environment and, and the oceans and coasts will win once we identify all of these other non-market values and get them in the equation. And we, we can win this. We, don't, we shouldn't be afraid of the economics. We should embrace it. And the final point I'll leave you with is that it won't just benefit us. Um, but it'll benefit non-humans as well. That's exactly how it should be. Uh, but that's the topic for another talk. Thanks a lot.